occasion of his extremely sacred appearance day. So I speak on three quotes from Bhakti Sanskrit Thakur, which the theme I'll speak on, Bhakti Sanskrit Thakur's instructions on outreach, on sharing Krishna consciousness with others. So, I'll talk about three points, the purpose of outreach, the perspective in outreach and the process of outreach. Purpose, perspective and process. And one of the most uh, instructive and inspiring aspects of the teachings of Bhakti Sanat Thakur for me was the address that he gave to his disciples when they were about to go abroad. It is a historic moment in the history of the Gaudiya Math when in the 1930s, 33-34, he sent his disciples first abroad. So these three quotes that I will be speaking on are not directly from that lecture, but it is, these three quotes broadly reflect the mood of that talk. And while explaining those quotes, analyzing those quotes, we will give you some examples from Bhakti Sanskrit Thakur's life, as well as Mishra Prabhupada's life, and from our situation also. And of course, ultimately, the preaching is not just to be done to others, we have to preach to the soul inside this body also. So we'll see how these instructions apply to us in our own spiritual groups. And Acharya is known much more by their words than by their appearance or by their, their looks or anything like that. So focusing on their quotes is a poem. The wisdom that they have given through their quotes is a way by which we can carry on the legacy of wisdom with us. Uh, many of the Sanskrit appearance days, we have probably heard most of his activities, his pastimes. So let's focus on his teachings and what we can learn from those teachings today. So, <clears throat> the first quote is what is the purpose of when we are trying to share Krishna consciousness? What is the purpose? So, I'll say this quote and you can repeat this quote after me. And I'll discuss the quote and then we can also repeat the quote. So that's all the all three quotes are the simple quotes. But <coughs> he says that the only purpose of the most merciful persons is to transform the degraded taste of people. So we'll repeat this. The only person, only purpose of the most merciful persons. Is to transform the degraded taste of people. Transform the degraded taste of people. Yes. So this just goes to the heart of what we are trying to do. Sometimes we get caught in the externals of outreach. Okay, how many books have I distributed? Okay, how many temples have we done? How many people are coming to the temple? How many people are getting initiated? How many people come for my classes? How many people are there in our temple? And how many are there in your temple? There will be the externals are no doubt important. But if you get caught in the externals, sometimes you may just become competitive. You know, oh, I distribute more than books than you. More people come to hear my classes than your classes. And <clears throat> or you may feel disheartened. You may say, okay, you know, our temple only a few hundred people come, but that church, that temple, thousands and thousands of people are coming there. So, are we on the right path or is there some other path? Maybe I should be going somewhere where most people are going. So like that, sometimes we get caught in the externals. But the, yes, we are not here to just increase the ranks of an organization. We are not here although to convert people to our way of thinking. Our purpose is to transform the taste of now, what do we mean by transform the, he specifically says transform the degraded taste of people. All of us have an innate tendency to seek pleasure. <coughs> and we all seek pleasure in different ways depending on the level of consciousness. So there are three modes, Sattva, Rajas and Tamas. And based on these three modes, 
our conception of pleasure changes our taste changes say if in terms of interpersonal relationship you would want to say people in tamas often get pleasure in causing pain to others see i have so much power to cause this much pain to so that was what mrugari was doing his profession was hunting but he was not just doing his profession he was actually inflicting torture on animals and hurting them terribly and he was get joy how oh, is it i can cause you so much pain so that's a very very horrendously degrading twist so in passion in ignorance in tamas we we get joy in hurting others uh, of course tamas has many other aspects of it but that's one example of a very very distorted taste in rajas we may get taste in gross sensuality how purification means to understand that the impure is impure if we are not pure we don't even understand that the impure is impure i mean that's the way what everybody is doing that's what i am also doing so some people may just say you go to all kinds of sensual activities they say as a normal way to live everybody is living like that but the consideration of purity and impurity comes when there is some sattva in sattva we can perceive sarva bhavare shude he is in prakash upachavyate yanam vidata da vidya vivruddham sattva ityuta so when our inner eye opens when we can perceive what should go inside our senses and what should not go inside our senses then what should come out of our senses or should not come out of our senses that is what we should see what we should speak what we should eat when we start discerning this that's when we come to goodness now here it's not just a matter of self control in sattva a person is naturally attracted to sattvic food and is naturally not attracted to say meat or other kind of rajasic tamasic foods so it's a our taste is determined by our level of consciousness and the process of bhakti is meant to transform the taste of people it is meant to give people a higher taste like right? vishnu chakra thakur says in a kavita purport that uh, that there is no greater need in society then a urgent need to give people higher taste so if people can experience higher taste then they will themselves start longing for it more and once they start longing for it more they will start going on their spiritual journey so the lasting benefit we can do to people is to transform their taste and if you think in these terms the purpose of our creatures to transform the taste of people now our taste can be in terms of pleasure taste can also be in terms of shelter everybody faces problems in life amid its problems how do we respond what do we take shelter of some people just start drinking some people just start watching a lot of tv some people just go to sleep some people just are over eating but if at that time we take shelter so what we do for getting pleasure and what we do for getting shelter these two broad things indicate where our taste lies see our life journey is at one side one level if you consider it like a time a flow of time on the y axis we look back say i was born in 1975 or whatever 1940 1947 and whatever year and we look back if you look at our past life and life you look at it's not like a flat line if you there are certain incidents which stand out like mountains some things which are not like tall peaks and other is like a plateau so the incidents that stand out in our life are either the incidents of great pleasure or the incidents of great pain and now what we do in those situations defines our life trajectory quite a bit so transforming our taste is the purpose of which now of um <clears throat> i let's take a couple of examples from the sanskrit thakur's own way of going out which often we know bhakti sanskrit thakur as simhuru as the uncompromising strong 
speaker who presented Krishna Bhakti. How, in general, no designation is, is a description in an exhaustive way. Every designation, it, it designates something. The person is actually always bigger than any designation. So any kind of glorification we may do of a person also. We take one quality and glorify it. But the person has many other qualities. So yes, Bhaktisant Sarakur was uncompromising, but he was also much, much more. So I'll talk about two aspects of how he tried to give higher taste to people, tried to transform people's tastes. Now, when we are to transform people's tastes, how do we go about doing it? Now, we, are, we at one level, we work on what's bad within us. And we work with what's good within us. That means if somebody has some bad taste, say some taste in some sensuality, something, something which is immoral, something which is sinful, then we have to work on that to give it up. But work with what's good. So if somebody has a taste for singing, somebody has a taste for music, somebody has a taste for decoration, somebody has a, a, a likes and passion for speaking, somebody who likes to go and meet people. Uh, outward, outgoing. So then that's good. So work on what's bad in us, but we have to work with what's good in us. So the transformation of taste is not just a rejection of our present tastes. It's also a utilization of the present tastes. So there are certain things which we all have to give up. But there are certain things which have to be utilized. So one of the things that Bhaktisan Sankhapur very strongly innovated, you could say, is that the use of dioramas in presently Krishna Bhakti. <clears throat> if you consider the historical phase when Bhaktisan Sankhapur appeared and shared Krishna Bhakti. He started the Gaudiya Mata in 1919. And he, of course, initiated his first disciple in 1905-1906. And uh, that time, uh, both his guru, Gaudiya Babaji, and his Param Guru, Bhakti Rutaka, both of them were there on the planet. And they were just across. Gaudiya he was in Mayapur, Gaudiya Babaji was on the other side of the river in Mayapur. And, Bhaktis and his uh, Param Guru Bhakti Nuthaka was living in Kolkata at that time. So, he didn't take those who were aspiring for initiation to them. Why not? He had their blessings. And more importantly, spiritual master and disciple is a personal relationship. So, whoever we are inspired by, we need to uh, take, get connected with them. But his real preaching started from 1919. So, 1919 to 1937, about 18 years, that was a big change. So, before that he was preparing quite a lot in terms of, <clears throat> he did a lot of austerities, chanted million names of Krishna uh, and fasted in a very austere way. But then, when he, started, when he relocated from Mayapur to Kolkata, Mean that Kolkata is a place where people are, and that is where we need to go if we want to reach people. So one of the things he started using was dioramas. This was the time when India was in a state of fermenting. There was enormous political upheaval over there. The Indian independence struggle was slowly moving to an upper momentum, and religion was a very powerful force in India and the political leaders were using religion also as a galvanizing force. But at the same time, religion was also an object of criticism in many ways. Oh, people are so old-fashioned, people are so superstitious, people are so unscientific. So, Bhaktisan Thakur, rather than focusing on the religious aspect of devotion, focused on the artistic aspect of devotion. So the dioramas were of sacred images. If any of you have been to Mayapur, you will see even now in some of the Gaudiya Mats, there are several dioramas that are kept over there. 
and i remember uh, basically of say lord chaitanya mahaprabhu performing with his past tense delivering jagai and madai lord chaitanya mahaprabhu showing his uh, vishwarupa lord chaitanya mahaprabhu as a small child eating dust uh, eating dust so like that the very past tense of chaitanya mahaprabhu and past tense of krishna with some philosophical message so people would not so so not many people would come to hear classes there are certain people who are always ready to come for direct outreach Just come and hear classes and learn but many people are not ready for that and how do we reach those people so the dioramas where people where people could get to see something and while see there's an explanation and far more people started coming to the temple because the dairama was in the temple premises because of that they started coming to the temple and actually because they had some piety they would also come to the deities and take darshan so if people have to come to the temple only to take darshan of the deities then not many people will come many times when people say the temples are famous <coughs> one thing about them is that they have like big architect they have beautiful architecture they have big size something special most people who come to the temple they come to see the temple not the deities <laughs> that's a difference they okay deities just take darshan for one or two minutes even in our own lives if we had to come to the temple more often than not we come to associate with devotees Yes, we want to take darshan of the deities. Unless we have a specific service of worshiping the deities, just taking darshan is not the only purpose. So basically, when we have to give taste to people, what it means is either one thing is this is the bhakti, and this is your taste. Give up that taste and come over here. But another way is that we expand the ambit of bhakti, so that whatever is an existing taste within people, that intersects with bhakti. So people like to go on sightseeing. see something beautiful so then he had beautiful dioramas and he personally spent a lot of time energy and resources for making these dioramas so he it means when you have to transform the taste of people we have to give people opportunities to experience higher taste within the taste that they are experiencing right now so within the taste if they they like music and within their taste for music we give a taste of the music if they like a taste for art then within their taste for art we give them the bhakti art so another dramatic thing that bhakti sanskar put it was his theistic exhibitions and the theistic exhibitions were huge arrangements exhibition on a big ground and on that ground there would be remarkably 50% of the exhibits we would classify today as monday those <laughs> exhibits were of scientific progress of technological achievement of some <coughs> some kind of innovation that might have been done some nearby village so it is all about material things which had been which were like material breakthroughs or material progresses and because of that thousands and thousands of people would come even many of the illuminate uh, the dignitaries of calcutta they would come for those three six exhibitions they were the three six exhibitions became like a high point uh, in the annual calendar of calcutta and then the remaining 50% would be devotional exhibits and they would arrange he would arrange the like if there is a big event or a big uh, if you go into a fair if you go to into disney land or something like that some fair then there is one entrance and there will be small ways out but otherwise it's like a long circle you go through you go in and you come out so people would go to see these theistic exhibitions and the way would be such that you would also go to all the devotional exhibits and there there would be all these dioramas and other things where the teachings of lord chaitanya and the grace and the message of bhakti would be presented over there so the idea is 
people at that time were very attracted by science and technology and scientific and technological advancement. So Bhakti Sanskar used that to get people to come to Krishna. The idea is that we have to find out how we can connect people's mind with Krishna. Uh, how we can get people's minds to focus on Krishna. Bhakti no. Srila Prabhupada at one time said, I have simply repeated the word of my spiritual master. I haven't, I haven't changed even one thing. Another time, Prabhupada said that this whole Krishna consciousness movement has been practically invented by me. The whole Krishna consciousness movement. Now what did he mean? He speaks this in his lectures on the lecture of devotion, which he gave in Vrindavan. <coughs> and here the point is, he is explaining this yena kena prakarena manaha krishna nivejana. Somehow or the other, fix the mind with Krishna. And in that context, he says that it is the responsibility of the spiritual master to create ways and means for the disciples to fix the mind of Krishna. So rather than saying, you have to fix the mind of Krishna. Okay, how can you fix the mind of Krishna? Let me think. And it is the responsibility of the spiritual master to create ways and means to help the disciple fix the mind of Krishna. And one of the most popular, uh, we could say, if you want to use the word innovations, of Srila Prabhupada, in outreach was the Rathyatra. Now Rathyatra of course were done <coughs> in Puri and many other places across the across the country, especially Odisha, Bengal. But doing Rathyatra abroad <coughs> on a day that is convenient for people at that place, that was a remarkable idea. And that helped the devotees utilize all their passion and resourcefulness <coughs> The Hitpi uh, is like to do crazy things. And probably one of the crazy things is just dance on the streets. Now, if earlier they had danced on the streets, they would have got in trouble with the police. But now they were dancing on the streets and they were escorted by the police. <laughs> so, Prabhupada, when he created the Rathyatra, it created a sensation among people. Among the hippies, they love it, just coming in front and dancing and just going along the roads and then giving food and giving giving Krishna conscious in various ways to people. So by this, what Sri Prabhupada gave people the means by which they could fix the mind of Krishna. And in London the devotees had organized a big Rathyatra once. And they, they, the devotees earlier had like a big <coughs> In San Francisco and America, they had done Rathyatras. And the devotees in London decided we will make it bigger. And they made a much bigger one. But unfortunately, they didn't increase proportionately the strength of the wheels. So just before the Rathyatra was about to start, uh, it just started, the wheels crumbled. And the whole Rathyatra was a disaster, it was a fiasco. Then the devotees wrote to Prabhupada. Prabhupada, was it because of our poor devotion? That the Rath cart collapsed. Prabhupada replied, like, Not your pure emotion, it was your poor engineering. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, what Prabhupada did was, Yes, in the service of Krishna, look at the practicals and fix the practicals. So, now Prabhupada presented Krishna Pasha in such an inclusive way that actually so many things which people would normally not have thought of as bhakti. Prabhupada included that. The, one of the things we learn if we study language, especially the history of language, is that words have different meanings at different times. So, uh, Prabhupada expanded the semantic scope of the word Sankirtan. Sankirtan traditionally meant doing kirtan of the, in front of the law. Harina, uh, Nagar Sankirtan means going out into the streets and make doing Sankirtan. But Prabhupada expanded Sankirtan to include what? Book distribution, outreach, speaking about Krishna, distributing, going on Sankirtan, going on a Sankirtan bus party. 
Sakitan Bas Party has given up as one part of Milli Institution. So, young people like to do something adventurous, go to new places. So then use that it's for serving Krishna. So basically, bhakti means that, that the most merciful people, that their only purpose is to transform the degraded taste of being. So when we are also trying to practice bhakti ourselves, we have to see how I can transform my taste. And when we are trying to give Krishna bhakti to others, we say, okay, how can I help this person to get taste for bhakti? It is not that people you do this activity A, B, C, D. If you are doing this, you are a devotee. If you are not doing this, you are a devotee. Not like that. Okay, what are you doing right now? How can, within what you are doing, how can it help you to get a taste for Krishna? So this is, this is what the essence of outreach is. <clears throat> so this was the first point. Can you repeat after me? The only purpose of the most merciful persons is to transform the degraded taste of people. So, I was talking about outreach. The first was the purpose of outreach. The second is the perspective in outreach. Perspective means how do we see things, how do we see people. And this was this the quote which I am going to speak is one of the most, you could say, counterintuitive quotes. And it required a lot of thought and I looked at the context and looked at the other statement that Mr. Thakur had said and then I was able to appreciate what he said. He says, the, the pure devotee sees that everyone is the spiritual master. Therefore, the pure devotee is the Jagat Guru. Can you repeat after me? The pure devotee sees that everyone is the spiritual master. Therefore, the pure devotee is the Jagat Guru. Now, what is going on over here? How do you mean see everyone as the spiritual master? And to be able to see everyone as the spiritual master makes us the Jagat Guru. We could understand this at three different levels and if any of you would like have some reflections feel free to add that in your reflections so one understanding is that we see that Krishna can speak through us through anyone that Krishna can inspire us Krishna can instruct us through anyone that is we see Shri Prabhupada is distributing back to Godhead and a postman he suggested that Oh, so many people throw away magazines. You should write books. People will keep the books. And oh, this is my spiritual master speaking. So, everyone is a spiritual master. It doesn't mean literally everyone is a spiritual master whom we offer Guru Puja. It means that Krishna is the Jagat Guru who can speak through anyone. And one who sees the potential for Krishna to speak through anyone, that is the person who has the potential to be the Jagat Guru. So to be able to see that Krishna can speak to anyone, that is one level of understanding, that is, uh, that is the understanding, that is the level of consciousness that can also help us to reach out to <coughs> Incidentally about this postman or whoever who gave this uh, <coughs> suggestion to Prabhupada. I met Satsurut Maharaj in <coughs> upper, up, upstate New York. So he has written this Nidamrut. And he is telling that among this, this Lilamrath has six volumes and then one seven is appendix kind of volume. So he said the last five volumes were easy to reach. The first volume was easy to write, literally speaking. The first volume was very difficult to write. He says, why is that? He said, when it came to writing the first volume, when say everything connected with Prabhupada's pre-ISKCON life, every good thing, there are hundreds of people who say, I did that. So the person who suggested to Prabhupada that you know, I, I suggested that we should write books. So he said that, the Prabhupada just told us, somebody suggested that to me. And I saw it as a master speaking. But who was that? When he came to India, he said over a hundred people said, I told Swamiji that, I told Swamiji that, I told Swamiji that. So actually to write a biography, 
often you don't need just to be an author. You actually need to become a detective. <laughs> <laughs> to find out who is speaking the truth and who is not speaking the truth. But anyway, the point is that that's one level of understanding. That Krishna can speak through anyone to us. We see that level of Krishna consciousness. Another is that <clears throat> we see that even those who are assisting us in serving Krishna, they are also represented as a pastoral journey master. You see that Prabhupada <coughs> would often say to his disciples, all of you have been sent by my spiritual master. And he did not just see them as they are serving me. He said that I am serving my spiritual master and they are assisting me in my service to my spiritual so therefore, they have been sent by my spiritual master. So in that sense, everyone is a spiritual master. So if we have that vision of service, not a vision of lordship, yeah. then we can be the Jagat Guru. So the more powerful, the more influential we become, the more there is a tendency to become infatuated. So somebody who has to have the maturity to become the Jagat Guru, they should be able to see that everyone is actually serving my Guru, serving Krishna. Everyone is a spiritual master. Bhakti Sarasura Thakur, would often refer even to his disciples as my Prabhu. And he would often, that assaults me, that I am a servant. That was the mood in which he would speak and write. The third level is <coughs> what we can consider as the <coughs> most important for outreach. <coughs> See, everyone is a spiritual master means that ultimately, each person is different and we have to find out how that person can be connected with Krishna and for that we need to learn from that person. When Bhaktisam, when Chila Prabhupada came to the West, can I take first Bhaktisam for example, one of my friends has done his PhD in Bhaktisam Sri Thakur, did a lot of research in Bengal going for looking for various manuscripts and everything. So he showed me a big, you could call it like a pocket diary. And then glancing through it, it is amazing. It was Bhakti Siddhan Sathakur's vocabulary book. Yeah. He used to, in his 1910-1920, he was actually memorizing English books. Because one thing, the challenge in India is that, if you are Indians, there are very speaker, very few uh, native English speakers. <coughs> So, how a language is to be spoken, you don't know that. You can read the language, you can write also, but how words are pronounced, how words are to be spoken. And the British who were there also, British, most of the British who were there, were there for, they were for colonial purposes. Now, very few people, British who were philosophically interested with it. So, Bhaktisarasa Thakur spent a lot of time and energy learning English. He was not just learning English, you could say that by his purity, he, by his pure intention to glorify Krishna through English, he was purifying the English language. So, what, he put an effort over there to see how best I can communicate. Similarly, when Prabhupada came to America, at that time, if you see, he stayed first at the house of Sally and Gopal Agarwal. They were, his, they were the, his sponsors for the tour. And Sally Agarwal's interview was given in the uh, Lamrath, and there it is said, that Swamiji was extremely interested in everything American. Yeah, if I was using a vacuum cleaner, how did the vacuum cleaner work? If I was using a washing machine, how did it work? So now when I first read it, yeah, it just didn't make any sense to me. So, so she said, the way he is, she said that he was the most non-demanding guest that I ever had. So, Prabhupada, it seems, did not even ever push them to chant Hare Krishna or practice Bhakti. So, Prabhupada sensed after something, they are not really interested. So, Prabhupada did not push them. So, then I was talking with a senior devotee uh, who has uh, written a lot of Prabhupada. So, who was telling that at that time, Prabhupada was learning about the West. How do people live in the West? How do people think about the West? Think in the West. And through that learning, his first while, he had two month visa, one month he just stayed in Butler, Pennsylvania, and he's focusing entirely on just one or two programs in the whole two months, focusing on learning about the West. So, <clears throat> when, if we have to 
teach someone something, we have to learn to help them learn. It's I'll repeat this point. We have to learn to help them learn. Because they come from a different background, a different perspective. So everyone is a spiritual master. Doesn't mean that they will give Krishna to everyone. What Dr. Sanjaka quote means is that they can teach us how we can teach them. If we have that learning mood, we will be able to understand how we can help them understand. And that requires commitment and compassion. For many people, their idea of preaching Krishna consciousness is you have like one script and anyone you meet, download that script on them. And yes, some people may get attracted by that, but many may not. So, we have to understand how to help people understand. Bhaktisandra Rakur in another place, he says that Prabhupada also related the same thing. He says that people in the mode of, in the lower mode of nature, they, they, their minds are not functioning properly. They are almost like mad people. So, <clears throat> a related example we could take is, say if a, if a child has some learning disability, say a child has dyslexia, then the, there is a normal method of teaching. But that method may not work for the child. Because of some children, they just can't read letters. The letters seem to be all moving for them. And they look at it, they just can't read, it's all floating. So then, there are special techniques which are used to teach those children. So the parents have to learn how to help the children. So similarly, if we want to share Krishna Bhakti, we have to learn how to help people learn. And that's why in that sense, everyone is a spiritual master. Srila Prabhupada, again, we often see him as a person who is always really cutting. You know, fools and rascals and things like that. But if we, if we interact with Prabhupada's disciples, and we read their personal experiences, who had personal experience with Prabhupada, says, Prabhupada made everyone feel valued. Those who met Prabhupada, they felt Prabhupada really cared for me. <clears throat> so it was what attracted them. They said that the Swami was really such a clearly such a learned person, a spiritually evolved person. But he respected us, he told us, he understood us. So Prabhupada saw the spiritual spark in them and he offered them the facility to come to us. So this <clears throat> Prabhupada also adopted this one. He, he, he used the terminology associated with drugs because drugs was very high at that time. Drugs was very popular. So people wanted to go high and Prabhupada adopted stay high forever. So Prabhupada did these things. Similarly, somebody asked Prabhupada once, Swamiji, what is the bliss of Vaikuntha like? And this person just was stoned coming down from drugs. Now Prabhupada could have quoted Chinta, Mani Prakara, Satma, Shukha, Vraksha. Now what would that person have understood? <laughs> so Prabhupada said, Vaikuntha is like an ocean of LSD. <laughs> an ocean of LSD. Oh wow. I want to go there. <laughs> now somebody who does not have that attitude that everyone is a spiritual master. Somebody doesn't have the attitude that I can learn from others about how to help them learn. That person says, what are you doing? Oh, the drugs is tamasic. Vaikuntha is pure Shuddha Sattva. How can you compare the bliss of Vaikuntha with, with whatever tamasic way of taking LSD? Where in the Shastra is it said like this. The bliss of Vaikuntha is like an ocean of LSD. Now the person who asks this question misses the point. The point of outreach is not just to get it right. The point of outreach is to get it across. We may get something right entirely, but if people don't understand it, just like a child has dyslexia and the teacher gives a perfect class according to normal standards, the child doesn't understand it. The, child got, the teacher got everything right, but got nothing across. So in Kali Yuga, people are all Mandashi Mandamatayo Mandabhagya 
So we are all in many ways deficient. In the capacity to learn spirituality, it's deficient. And thus, we need to learn how to help people learn. So what Prabhupada was doing was presenting Krishna Bhakti, the joy of Krishna Bhakti in terms that would make sense to people. So for a person whose only conception of pleasure is taking the drugs, then yes, it's like an ocean of drugs. Oh, you know, to get it across. And to get it across, we need to understand where people are at. So in that sense, everyone is a spiritual master. If you are interacting with someone, it's not, yes, we do want to share Krishna with them. But to share Krishna with them, we have to understand where they are coming from, what their means are. And they will tell it to us if we hear from them. When I had started a Western outreach about some sort of small way, but I started doing this in 2014 in Melbourne was the first place I had come. So I had met His Holy Devamad Maharaj here. And he told me that if you want to connect with Western people, since you have to spend time with them, just hear them speak. So understand where they are coming from. So to the extent we do that, so we learn a lot. So I try to follow a principle, not always I'm successful. So that on the Vyasasan I speak, of the Vyasasan I hear. So I try to do that. Let people speak, understand where they're coming from. The temptation to speak is very strong. Especially if somebody who thinks of themselves as a preacher, it's a very strong temptation to start speaking. But how much of what we speak is relevant to people, we need to hear them, we understand them, then we speak. So see, everyone is the spiritual master in the sense that ultimately the spiritual master connects us with Krishna. So they will give us the inputs about how we can connect them with Krishna. If you think of this, I got this script, I download this, I this person not become a devotee. Yeah, that person is a devotee. If you start doing like this, then we are not going to connect with anyone. So this was the second point. Can you repeat after me, the second quote? <coughs> <coughs> the pure devotee sees that everyone is a spiritual master. The pure devotee sees that everyone is a spiritual master. Therefore, the pure devotee is the Jagadguru. Therefore, the pure devotee is the Jagadguru. So, let me go to the last point now. This is a quote which Prabhupada also had quoted. But in this context, I thought for outreach, the purpose, the perspective, and the process. So here Rukhan Rahman says that without shedding hundreds of gallons of hard-earned blood, we will never be able to make people understand the truth. So it's a very this significant statement. Now, Prabhupada put it in a different way, he said, to get one soul to Krishna, you have to shed salons of blood, shed gallons of blood. It's essentially the same. But here, Bhaktisattva Thakur's stress is not on people are less intelligent, people don't understand. He's saying that we have to put this effort. It is for us to shed this much gallons of blood. That means, rather than saying that people are uninterested, people are fallen, people are degraded, we take the effort that where people are at, how can we get them to Krishna? So in every situation we are in, <clears throat> we always have a choice. Even if we are in a very, very bad situation. See, most of us uh, may have some expertise in this field or that field or that field. Some of us may be good at singing, some of us may be good at, uh, good at speaking, some of us may be good at managing. Very, very, we may have our particular expertise. But our mind makes us all expert in one thing. And that is, the mind makes us expert in blaming everything except ourselves. In blaming our situation for our condition. I am shocked temple. I was in the temple and there was this devotee who used to just yell at everyone. And he was a prominent leader over there. And everybody was fried out by that. And then I was talking with this devotee and he said, if people did what I told them, I wouldn't have yelled at them. So, instead of taking responsibility, 
Hey, people are not your slaves. Then they will have to do what you have to tell them, what you tell them. Even if we are in a position of authority, you have to communicate properly. So if somebody doesn't take responsibility, why am I yelling at them? Because they are not doing what I tell them. Then, if one doesn't take responsibility once and one blames the other, then we cannot change. So, in today's age, it's very easy to blame others. If you are doing outreach, oh, people are so materialistic. Oh, it's Kalinga now. What can you do in Kalinga? Nobody is going to come. Now, if we have that attitude, then we will not be able to reach people. So it is for us to take the initiative, it is for us to take the responsibility, it is for us to take the effort to reach people. And to, now reaching people is not just physically going to people. Reaching people is actually reaching people emotionally, intellectually and spiritually. So for the, so the, the effort that we have to share, the physical effort of reaching out to people is something, yes. We may travel for distribution, we may travel for our travel as a traveling preacher. We have to put in effort for that also. And both Bhaktisana Thakur and Srila Prabhupada were pioneers in that. Bhaktisana Thakur, when he had his disciples going abroad, it was, it was like a very, very bold thing. So he had no contacts, I mean, he did not have any big contacts. So he had his two disciples go from here to abroad, from India to abroad. And they were fully funded. And he had to actually engage many devotees in India and fundraising just so that those devotees could be funded over there. Where they will stay, how they will get their prachar, how they will travel. Every single thing he arranged from India. And then he sent the disciples there. So he was very much involved in it. In fact, every program that they had, Actually, the speech, the talk that they would give over there, they would write it, they would send it to India, to Bhaktisanthakur. <laughs> Bhaktisanthakur would go through it, edit it, and would send it back. And then they would do that talk. So, especially now they have of course more small informal programs, but sometimes they got the opportunity to address the address some big university, some university or some gathering of Lord or something like that. And put in a huge amount of effort. It actually drained the mission of God a lot, that whole endeavor. And it's not that uh, it's not that they were not successful. But they tried to reach a certain elite kind of people. And they were successful in the sense that many people appreciated what they did. So uh, so I'll talk about that in the end, how the legacy is continued. But here the point is putting an effort to reach to people. So Shri Prabhupada, so one effort is of course physically we have to reach them. We have to go where people are at. A devotee is tireless in outreach, but a devotee is not headless in outreach or brainless. Not even a tireless. Bhakti Sanskrit said that if you go for a program and nobody comes, what should we do? Does anyone remember? Yes. Speak to the walls. Yes. Be untiring. Be never get disheartened. Speak to the walls. Just by speaking to the walls, you become beautiful. At the same time, when Prabhupada was speaking in India, and people were not interested, Prabhupada was not satisfied speaking to the walls. Prabhupada actually took the whole effort to go from India to America, all the way. And thus, he found in America an audience that is receptive. So, at, at one in spirit, a devotee is untiring, is tireless. But in actual practice, a devotee is intelligent to see what works and what doesn't work. And that's how a devotee shares Krishna. Now, we have to follow our spiritual guides, we have to follow our spiritual masters, we have to follow our spiritual our acharyas, but we have to follow them in an intelligent way. So, uh, we have to reach them. Now, when Bhaktisana Thakur, the first meeting with Chita Prabhupada, Prabhupada just one young man first came to a temple. And it's amazing. Prabhupada just, what, what did Bhaktisana Thakur tell him? Yeah, you are educated, you are educated, a young man. I don't 
Please don't ask Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Oh, my. Oh, it was a bhai and I could speak and I thought, what is this? And then later on I talked with some of, some, some devotees again, <coughs> who had done a lot of research in Prabhupada's uh, life and writings, or uh, written about Prabhupada. So I asked him, wasn't this like a one-time incident that Bhaktivedanta Swamiji spoke this only to Abhay, uh, who became Prabhupada later on? He said, no. Bhaktivedanta Swamiji was so eager that Krishna consciousness spread that he would look at everyone as a potential for receiving and sharing Krishna consciousness. So that go to the West and preach, this was not just Prabhupada's instruction for or not just Bhaktivedanta Swamiji's instruction for Prabhupada. Like an instruction for all his disciples. And anybody who could do anything about it, who was not going to express that desire. Of course, the direct in the first meeting, directly speaking that there is no record as of now of what I have come across. That Prabhupada said like directly the first meeting to someone like that. But still, point was saw the opportunities. Yes, you should share. So now Bhaktivedanta <coughs> He, Prabhupada himself at one point said that you know, we are like salespeople for Krishna consciousness. And he said every salesperson has their own technique for selling. The important thing is not to follow the technique. The important thing is to sell the product. So if you consider in many ways, Bhakti Siddhanta Siddhartha and Shri Prabhupada, the sales technique was quite different. Bhaktisara Thakur, there is very little direct criticism of Western culture. There is a criticism of empiricism. Of empir the, the, he says many places that the materialistic demeanor cannot stretch to the absolute truth. Empiricism, the Pratyaksha Pramana as a means to understand the absolute, he said that you cannot do that. You cannot understand it. But if you read the lecture, that Bhakti Sanskrava gave to his disciples when they were going abroad. <coughs> One thing which strikes very significantly is that he says, be respectful to people. He, he, says, he says that in the West, uh, they are going to UK actually at that time. So in UK, people think that they are very progressive because they have got so much scientific and technological advancement. And Bhaktivedanta Thakur doesn't follow this and say that they are foolish, they are thinking is foolish. He says, because they think they are so progressive, they expect respect. And we need to, with humility, offer them that respect. But then we have to show them that there is another kind of progress that can be got only by the mercy of Chaitanya. And we have come to give them that. So he said, don't minimize, don't criticize what they have achieved. Appreciate that. <coughs> <coughs> and also tell them that there's more to achieve. So now again, sometimes we reduce the Rupa, the poor person who is always telling scientists of fools and rascals. Now if you look at Prabhupada, it was not always that way. I was talking with Giriraj Maharaj, Giriraj Maharaj has written a book on Prabhupada's uh, on, uh, battle to get the Jehu temple. It's a magnificent book. So it's on 800 page, two volumes, going to come out soon. So he says that, he asked Prabhupada, and Prabhupada was the famous talks in Venice speech, where from that, the life comes from life has come out that book. So he asked Prabhupada, that Prabhupada, when you speak about scientists, he said that you often use strong words, fools and rascals. So they were going to organize a big conference in 1976 about life comes from life. He says, when we talk with scientists, should we speak like that? And he was asking, Prabhupada, you are horrified. This is obviously not. He said, you polite, courteous, respectful, be like gentlemen. Speak like gentlemen. So now, what is going on over here? A lot is dependent on context. And when we take statements out of context, it can create a lot of uh, misrepresentation. 
So Prabhupada, and then speaking to his intimate disciples, he wanted to disabuse them of whatever faith they may have in science as a proof to ultimate knowledge. But Prabhupada was not only in science at all. Prabhupada used science, he used printing press, he used airplanes, and he used dictaphones. And he went to his work and he acknowledged that it worked. Prabhupada says that we are not against science, the science is the spirit of knowing. We are against the atheism. So, the point which I am making over here is that we have to give credit where it is due. And it is shed gallons of blood. Offer that gallons of blood that we have to share is not so much in convincing others, but in, it is also in changing our preconceptions. We have to, we all have this, this is right, this is wrong. And we have to, we have to change our preconceptions. So if we don't do that, then we impose our preconception on people and we categorize, label, demonize people and we go away. So from a functional perspective, after, after traveling across the world for several years and interacting with many different people, I have come up with a functional definition of humility. You know, humility means to acknowledge the complexity of reality. The complexity of reality. Things are not as simple as we think. If somebody is doing something, why are they doing like that? There could be many reasons. We may assign one reason. So, Pakistan Thakur is to intellectually reach people. Why do they think like this? If you just say this is wrong. No, but that's what is right for them at that time. They got some experience because of which they think it is right. So we have to be sensitive, we have to be respectful. A lot of effort in outreach is in increasing our own sensitivity, increasing our own non-judgmentality, so that we can connect with people before we alienate them. And as preachers, often sometimes we may be proud. I brought this person to Krishna. I brought this person to Krishna. I brought so many souls to Krishna. Now we may proudly take account of that. But all of us have no count of how many people did not come to Krishna because of us. <laughs> because of the way we spoke, we were judgmental, we were dismissive, we were critical, we were insensitive, we were responsible. So many people may have not come to Krishna because of us. So that ocean of the, the gallons of blood that has to be shared, that has to be shared in terms of increasing our our open-mindedness, increasing our sensitivity by which we can reach people where they are and then help them come to such. So, Bhaktisam Thakur is a whole mood that they deserve, they think they are progressive, they expect respect, give them respect. Dante Nidhayatana. So, Vishnu Shikha also says that if you meet a wealthy person, you meet a powerful person, he so offer obeisances to that person. He says, you are so glorious, you are so wealthy, you are so famous. And then, he says, now give up all your nonsense and take the mercy of God. So now, and this is Prabhupada paraphrasing it, but the idea is, if people do not feel accepted and respected where they are at, they will not come to us. So, Bhaktisana Thakur would go out of his way to accept and respect people. <laughs> when, <laughs> There was a, a prominent official in the Indian government was going to come. They had the vice roy and then they, were, they had like governor general or something of each of the principalities. So when that was, he was going to come, the, the governor general of that, the Bengal principality was going to come to, come to Mayapur, where Bhaktisana Thakur had his center. At that time, God had center, at that time, Bhaktisana Thakur arranged everything for him in impeccable fashion. fashion. Bhaktisattva had all his sannyasi disciples dressed in shirt pant. He himself dressed in shirt pant. And he had them take them around everywhere and show them all the places. So he made, if somebody is coming to us, we try to make them as comfortable as possible so that they can come closer to Krishna. So that is where we have to share blood. When we had this beautiful temple, big, we got a big place in LA, at that time a big place. Or a big, so there was actually a church and they had views over there. 
And we got the church, Prabhupada told the devotees that keep the views. And Prabhupada said, let people come in with their shoes. No need to ask them to remove views. Come in with their shoes and let them hear talks about Krishna consciousness. And just have the deities elsewhere. Of course, later on in our movement, uh, couldn't continue at that pace. So we didn't have any other place for the deities and because we needed a big place, so devotees removed the views from there. But Prabhupada wanted to make Krishna conscious as comfortable as possible for people. And Bhakti Sanskrakur also had that move. So, unless people feel accepted, respected, people feel that coming to Krishna consciousness is comfortable, they are not going to come to it. And creating that facility is our response. That is where we have to shed blood. So, when Prabhupada was in Mayapur and the devotees were constructed, we building all this building, this long building. When the, <clears throat> when the long building was constructed in Mayapur, if you go to Mayapur, there is this building. Long, it's called a long building also. Yeah. So at that time, it was one of the longest buildings in Bengal. Now, of course, there are much bigger, building, bigger buildings. But to try to construct that at that time is a big difficulty. So, but then Prabhupada in lectures, he says that as far as we are concerned, we can simply eat some kichari and chant the Krishna. But if that is what we do, people will not come. They need facilities. They need to have a comfortable place to stay so that they can go to Krishna. That is for them, we are building these things. We are building, not the temple, the temple also, we are building these guest houses. So Prabhupada said that actually it is we who have to take the effort to make Krishna consciousness as easy, as accessible, as comfortable as possible. Sometimes we think preaching in an uncompromising way means make people as uncomfortable as possible. This is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, everything about you is wrong, unless you surrender to me. We do that, very, very few people are likely to come. So, I'll conclude with one example of this comfort. What does it mean to shed blood? So, <clears throat> suppose somebody is out in the cold, the weather is cold and they are chilling, and they have got, they are poor, and they just got one tattered cloth. It's thin and tattered, and it can barely offer any protection from cold. And then, if we go to them and we, we tell them, actually, this cloth is so torn and tattered. Give it up. I will give you a very warm, woolen, cozy robe. We put that and you will be comfortable. Now, our intention may be very good. But for that person, that cloth is the only thing that is protecting them from cold. Even if it is protecting them very little, but it is protecting them. If we tell them, give up that cloth, they may oppose it. Now, if they say that that cloth is totally not helping you, it's hurting you, no, they won't give it up. But if where they are at, just take this cloth. Take this, put it around. How does it feel? Oh, hey, this is good. As they start feeling the warmth, as they start feeling the comfort, then after a period of time, they will just think, well, this cloth inside I'm giving. <laughs> Who is it helping me? She is not protecting me. They will themselves cast it aside. So if we ask them to cast it aside first and then take our cloth, they will stick to it. But if we give them our cloth and let them experience the warmth, then they will themselves give up that earlier daughter, torn that cloth. So this cloth, I would say, it applies to our conceptions. Our conception of what is comfortable, our conception of what is spiritual. So, now sometimes if somebody says everything is one, immediately say, that's my body, they are my body. Now, actually, to call people Mayavadi is to give them too much credit. <laughs> Why too much credit? Because most Mayavad is its own way, quite a complicated philosophy. And most people, they just heard someone saying everything is one and today the age of conflict and uh, conflict and war and violence, everything is one, very nice, everything is one. 
Most people who we call as Maya Vadis, they have no idea what is Maya. So, actually, they have done something. Maybe they did some meditation, they did some something, and they experienced something. So, what happens is because they have experienced something, see, people who are Rajas and Tamas, if anything gives them a little experience of Sattva, for them, that is so special. I got so much relief with that. So, for them, that whatever conception they have, whatever practice they have done, whatever it is like their blanket for them. It is like their, their cloth which is protecting them. Even if that cloth is torn and tattered, you ask them, hey, how does this philosophy make sense? Now, how does this experience make sense? They say, actually they may nothing will make sense for them. Philosophically, logically. But still they follow it because they experience something over there. Some relief from Rajas and Thomas. So if you tell them this is nonsense, give it up. Then it's like telling them to give up the only law that is protecting them from cold. They can't do it. Just let them give them the, the warm, cozy blanket of Krishna consciousness. Just let them experience Krishna consciousness in a non-threatening, non-imposing, non-judgmental way. Let them come to Krishna. Let them experience Krishna. And if they experience Krishna, oh, this is so wonderful. Why do I need anything else? This is so wonderful. I want to experience this more. They will themselves give up their previous conceptions. Most people are not philosophical. And most people, even when they come to spirituality, it is not because of philosophy. There are four kinds of people who come to Krishna. Those who are distressed, those who are distressed, those who are distressed, and those who are distressed. <laughs> so, for most people, philosophy is not what is bringing them. They have some philosophical conception, but there is one small part of their life. And it is not even a major part of their life. But when we criticize it, they think, how dare you call me wrong? And then, they become very defensive, they really need it. So if philosophy is not an important part of their life, it is not an important part of why they are exploring spirituality, then we also don't have to make pointing out the wrongness or error in their philosophy a major part of our connection. Just connect them with them in a way that makes them comfortable. But the Sanskrit went to such an extreme that he said that if some very influential people are ready to come to the temple, if we have to cook meat for them, we we'll cook meat and feed. Not that meat, not that we will eat meat. I am not telling this by me, we will cook meat. Now, of course, we don't want to do that. That's not the point. But you say that it is our responsibility to make people feel comfortable with their communication. That is where we need to shed, shed gallons of blood. And when we do that, the legacy spreads. So, Bhaktisam Thakur, at one level, we could say his mission was not so successful. Gauriya Mat, there are 67 centers at its peak, 64 in India and 3 outside India. One in Rangoon, one in Hamburg and one in London. But then after his departure, it all crumbled. But that's only an external mission. It was his mission that was continuing to show the path. And even for the most glorious mission, <coughs> actually, the right time has to come. The right Deshakala Patra is required. Now, if we see there's a stage, only somebody is dancing. And say one person comes and dances for excellently for five minutes. And another person comes and dances for two hours. You may say the person who dances for two hours is so much more. It's a greater dancer. But then if we come to know that the person who is dancing for five minutes, actually below the floor all glass is there, broken glass. And on that broken glass, they dance for five minutes. Understand, my God. To dance on broken glass for five minutes is extremely difficult. The floor is nice. Dance for two hours and also it's laudable, but it's much easier. So when Bhakti Siddhan says Raghur was preaching, at that time the whole floor was like strewn with broken glass. Neither India nor the West was receptive. India was completely enamored by Political change and economic progress, and economic and scientific progress. 
and the West, especially UK, at that time because uh, the Second World War was just approaching and they had this colonial, colonial idea that we are delivering the people who are all dark and uncivilized. And in fact, Oscar Wilde, I think, has said that famously that it is the white man's burden to civilize all the uncivilized people of humanity. So, they had no receptivity. So, it was like the lack of receptivity in India and America and UK both. That was like dancing on glass floors. So, in spite of that, he, he and his followers went 367 centers. So, he got it. When Prabhupada came to America, that was a time when there was a tremendous interest in Indian spirituality. That is a tremendous interest because of various reasons. But people were open to spirituality and people were fed up with their materialistic way of life. So now Prabhupada told Krishna, Om, Nachao, Nachao, Prabhu, Nachao, Semanti. Please make me dance. And Krishna not only made Prabhupada dance, but Krishna gave Prabhupada the perfect stage to dance. Prabhupada came to America just at the right time. And Prabhupada was asked, no, Your spiritual master sent disciples to London. Why did you go down? So Prabhupada gave different answers at different times. One answer, of course, we know that by that time the center of influence of the Second World War had shifted. Before UK was ruling the whole world. So they said that from UK, the sun never sets. It was the pride of the British Empire. But within a few years, things change and the sun never rises there. So <laughs> it's so dark all the time. Hardly or as things have changed. So, UK, America had become the main center of power. Uh, and so, Prabhupada decided to go to America. West, but he went to a different place in the West. Rather than Prabhupada, in his own disarming humility, he said that if my spiritual master, my spiritual master said they couldn't succeed, I my chances my chance of succeeding are very less. Because if I have to fail, let me fail trying in some other place. Maybe there's a better chance of success. There is such a humility. Prabhupada went to New York just at the right time. When? Because of the counterculture, people were extremely receptive. Of course, Prabhupada had great challenges. They were receptive spiritually, in terms of knowing spiritually. But culturally, they were so far away. It was like Prabhupada had to cross an ocean to reach them. But see, Prabhupada did that remotely. So once Prabhupada was asked that, uh, Bhaktisvana Thakur preached in Bengal. Bhaktisvana Thakur preached in India. You preached all over the world. Therefore, you are written out. And Prabhupada became very, very grave. He says, Never think of this. He said, It is the joy of the father when the son does better than the father. And it is by their mercy that I have been able to do what I have done. So they did the groundwork. Prabhupada said, that Bhakti Thakur was the founder of the modern Krishna consciousness movement and Bhakti Thakur was the founder of the institutional structure for that movement and Prabhupada carried both of them the institution and the movement across the world. So Prabhupada, from Bhakti Thakur, the main legacy that he got. One time, some of his core brothers were criticizing Prabhupada for not having done, for having done something different from what Bhakti Thakur was doing. And Prabhupada said, <coughs> that asks them who has built more temples than me, who has written more books than me, who has got more disciples than me. Then Prabhupada said, the great thing, I have inherited the legacy of my spiritual master. It's very interesting because in terms of legacy, Prabhupada got nothing from his spiritual master. There's not a single assistant for his preaching, not a single rupee from the body of art. Not a single, not even an institutional letter to say that is coming from this organization. Prabhupada got nothing at all. But they want to give the legacy. The greatest legacy of the spiritual master is not in terms of things, resources. The greatest legacy of the spiritual master is the desire to glorify Krishna. The desire to get everyone to love Krishna. But the Sanat Thakur gave that desire to Shri And from that desire, there are books manifested, disciples manifested, temples manifested. So that is the legacy that is coming down from the Vichy So we can all pray, Shri Bhaktivedanta Thakur today, that he enrich us also with this legacy. The legacy of the desire to glorify 
Krishna. If we have the desire to glorify Krishna, our life will be enriched, and through us, the lives of many, many others will also be enriched. So, I'll quickly summarize what I spoke to. I spoke on the theme of Bhaktisuddhanta Thakur's three instructions on outreach the purpose, the perspective, and the process. In the purpose, I said, the only purpose of, of uh, the most merciful persons is to transform the degraded things of people. So our purpose is to think, how can I help people get the higher taste of Krishna Bhakti? So we work with the taste that they have at present and connect those tastes with Krishna. Expand the effort of Krishna Bhakti so that improve some of their existing tastes. I give the examples of Sanskrit in the diorama and the three situations. To don't take people's visual and technological tastes. And then I talk about Prabhupada using Patyatra as a means to don't take young people's tendency to do far out things like dancing on the streets. So rather than saying people have no taste, we try to expand the ambit of Krishna Bhakti. Then second instruction was that. <clears throat> the pure devotees see everyone as a spiritual master. Therefore, pure devotees can be pure are Jagadgurus. So what, therefore, so, what this means is, so at three levels. First is that pure devotee sees that Krishna can speak through anyone. Just like Prabhupada saw, his guru speaking through the postman who said, write books. And there is those who are assisting us in serving Krishna. Like Prabhupada saw his disciples also as being sent by his spiritual master. And thirdly, the spiritual master connects us with Krishna. So, how to connect people with Krishna? People themselves will tell it to us. We have to understand how to make them understand. Like a child with learning disabilities, the parents have to learn how to help the child to learn. So rather than simply judging people and condemning them for not being interested, we have to spend time understanding where they are coming from. Then we will be able to help them learn. And the last point was without sharing gallons of hard earned blood, we cannot help people, we cannot make people understand the truth. So, that gallons of blood is in terms of uh, not just imposing our script on people, but taking the effort to reach them where they are reach them physically, reach them emotionally, reach them culturally, reach them intellectually, reach them spiritually. So, Krishna consciousness has to be made as accessible and comfortable for people as possible. So, Bhakti Chakur himself was ready to dress in Western clothes so that the head of state of Bengal, when he came, he would feel comfortable with it. So, Prabhupada was ready to have views so that people could come and choose him. So similarly, if people are having some preconceptions, instead of criticizing their preconceptions, See, this is the, we see that this is the tattered, torn, thin cloth that is sheltering them from the cold of Rajas and Tamas. They are getting some sattva through this. So telling them to give it up, okay, just take this. Give them this thick cloth. Give them the experience of Krishna Bhakti. And then they will themselves put away the old cloth. So rather than countering their misconceptions, just give them the experience of Krishna. They will themselves give their misconceptions. And the legacy that Shri Prabhupada got from Hathasi Khatu is that we need the desire to glorify Krishna. From that, everything else manifested. We too can pray Shri Prabhupada Khatu on this day that he enrich our heart with the desire to glorify Krishna. Shri Prabhupada Sultan Sasi Khatu Ki. Shri Prabhupada Khatu Ravi Bhav Mahamahat Sir Ki. Shri Prabhupada Khatu Ravi Bhav Mahamahat Sir Ki. Thank you very much.